Hi, good afternoon, gentlemen, ladies. Um, thank you for attending today. Um, can I just run through um, the welcome? Um, I would like to welcome all present. Can I remind everyone that they will be broadcast live to the Combined Authority website and will be available for viewing? Can members please make sure that their phones are switched to silent and remember to turn their microphones off after speaking? Thank you. We shall begin. Can we, are there any apologies? Thank you, Chair. We've had apologies from Councillor Burgess-Joyce. Thank you. Declarations of interest? Thank you, Chair. We haven't received any declarations of interest today. Minutes of the last meeting? The minutes of the previous meeting for audit committee held on the 28th of July are included on 1 to 6. Can I ask if the minutes of the last meeting are agreed, please? Agreed. Okay, Councillor Maloney. Thanks, Chair. Two very minor points. First of all, I re represent Liverpool City Council. And secondly, my name is misspelt. It's M-O-L, not M-A-L. That's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is that okay? Apologies, Councillor Maloney. We'll get that fixed. So do you want me to sign these now? Or have you got a pen? Thank you. Thank you. Right, governance or update um, for the management breach conduct, uh, conduct and complaints and whistleblowing. Um, can I invite Andy Henderson, Senior to Inform Management Office, to present the government update, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I last came before the committee, I think it was November last year. I understand we've had a refresh of membership since then, so I'll just go over a bit of background first. Um, in 2019, the uh, committee's terms of reference were amended to now include information governance uh, responsibility for the combined authority. Um, my remit involves uh, over overseeing our activities under the Freedom of Information Act, the Environmental Information Regulations, the General Data Protection Regulations, uh, the Data Protection Act, and the Audit and Accountability Act uh, 2014. So a lot of information. Um, Combined Authority and Mersey Travel remain two separate um, statutory bodies. Uh, however, in practical terms, there's a, there's a, a lot of overlap between um, the handling. Um, I handle the requests for both Mersey Travel and the Combined Authority. Um, so all the, the figures that are provided in this report are uh, cumulative uh, for both organisations. Uh, the Freedom of Information Act and the Environmental Information Regulations, you may already be aware of them already um, through your work with the councils. They uh, allow members of the public to ask uh, for copies of any recorded information that we hold. Um, and unless there is a specific legal reason why uh, that information should not be disclosed, we have to provide it to them within 20 working days. Uh, the, the two sets of legislation are broadly similar. Um, the environmental information regulations, unsurprisingly, deal with environmental information, but they, uh, other than that, they are broadly similar. Um, the figures are, uh, again, combined for both FOI, the Freedom of Information Request, and for the environmental information regulations. Uh, for reference, I've included the 2019-20 the figures as well as the 2021. Uh, as you can see from that, uh, in the previous, in the last reporting year, there was a marked increase in the number of requests that the Combined Authority and Mosey Travel received, up to 193 from 91. Uh, and I think that's mainly due to the pandemic. I think the, the, the Combined Authority's profile rose considerably with the amount of um, work we were doing uh, and the, the work of the Metro Mayor, and that triggered a lot more questions that we received. Um, common topics that we were asked about are our strategic investment fund, our, the work done by our, um, our pro uh, program management office, um, things to do with our subsidised bus routes, obviously that's a very important work for, um, for the society that, that they serve. Lots of staffing details and major projects such as the, the local cycling and walking infrastructure plan, uh, as well as the LCR CARES system um, grants that we were 
overseeing and uh, the hospitality and leisure grants as well. So we, we received a lot, of, a lot of requests for that sort of information. Um, it, was mark, it was notable last year, and it's even more notable now, uh, that the number of requests we receive as a combined authority for information that we do not have, that's not within our power, uh, is significant. It was 23% in 2019-20, uh, it went up to 46% in uh, 2021. Uh, a lot of times the email addresses for FOI requests uh, get shared around quite a lot by journalist groups, um, social groups, and requests are sent out in a fairly uh, mass sort of um, e exercise. So we receive a lot of requests for things like social housing, which obviously we, are, we aren't directly involved with. Um, there was just one request um, over the course of 2020, 21 that wasn't responded to in time um, out of 193. That was purely because the information that um, we needed or the, the searches that we needed to, to do in order to answer the request, uh, all the, that information was held in our offsite storage facility. We were all working remotely. We weren't able to actually access it. So that was the only reason that one request went late. The standard rule of thumb for acceptable um, performance is around 90% um, response rate on time. So even with that one going late, we're still over 99% uh, response rate on time, which is um, encouraging. Uh, with the General Data Protection Regulation and Data Protection Act, these were all re requests for individuals' personal information. Um, with GDPR, the General Data Protection uh, Regulation came in in May 2018. It was an EU piece of legislation, which we have since uh, adopted fully in the UK post-Brexit. Uh, we deal with a number of different types of requests. Uh, sometimes they are from people asking for their own information as a subject access request. Sometimes from solicitors or insurance companies um, who need the information for legal proceedings. Uh, the, the police forces uh, are able to, to ask us for information if they need it for a criminal investigation. And we're also able to provide um, information to the missing persons unit of, of the Merseyside Police or any other police force um, if there are any uh, individuals who have serious concerns for their welfare. Um, as their concessionary travel passes were all registered with us, uh, we are able to provide the police with details of where these people may have um, used public transport on our network. Uh, the number of requests in 2021 uh, was down from 1920. Um, the vast majority of the requests that we receive, you can see from the, the table there, relate to legal proceedings. They are often CCTV requests for um, accidents in the tunnel. With the national lockdowns, the number of uh, individuals remote working, the traffic obviously was a lot lower in the tunnels um, than in normal times. Um, a knock-on effect of that was fewer accidents, which is obviously preferable. Uh, and fewer requests, so that explains the drop down there. Um, I've included the quarter one figures for 21-22, which is seeing a, uh, a, an uptick, which we would expect as, as uh, the world opens up again. Um, we also have lots of responsibilities away from requests for, for ha the proper and secure handling of personal information. That has been um, exemplified during remote working since we have for the past 18 months with the need to make sure that paper documents are, are, are kept secure at all times at, when they're outside the office environment. Um, making sure that people's workstations at home are secure, they're not overlooked by a window or anything like that where someone may be able to, to sneak a peek inside and, and find something they shouldn't do. And um, cyber security training has, was, has been mandatory for all staff, so that's all been completed to make sure that we're doing as much as we can to make sure that the personal data of our customers, of our staff, of our shareholders, um, the stakeholders, is all taken care of as much as possible. With um, the general data protection regulations being an EU piece of legislation, we did have to, as I said, um, adopt it into e uh, UK law. Uh, uh, an issue arose with um, the need for uh, accreditation, essentially, from the European Union to make sure that any data that came from the European Union to the United Kingdom was going to be dealt with um, securely and wasn't going to be used in, a, in an adverse way. That uh, adequate, adequate, adequacy decision, excuse me, um, did come through. Uh, it came through in the summer. 
um, but is reliant on the United Kingdom and the government not drastically veering away from the standards that the EU accepts uh, as sufficient. Uh, there have been uh, recent comments by um, the Culture Secretary Oliver Dowden. There has been a consultation that's just started, I think, in the last week or so about revisions to this to, uh, to make the use of personal data more of a um, more beneficial for businesses, less of a box ticking exercise, and potentially taking some of the the rights away from the the data subjects and and easing things so people can use it more freely. How that goes down um, with the European Union is to be determined, um, but potentially there could be a, a, an issue there in terms of international data transfers. It's not something that we do. Uh, a lot with the combined authority. I think we have one or two contracts that involve um, data transfers going from here to the European Union. Um, so it's something that we are keeping an eye on. Uh, our regulator for all of those th those legislations that I've talked about is the Information Commissioner. Um, the big headline thing with general data protection regulation is, is the ability to fine an organization either 4% of your global turnover or 20 million euros, so about 17, 18 million pounds. Um, we've only had one complaint that went to the information commissioner in the past year. Uh, it didn't result in any enforcement action. Um, all of our reviews in, uh, we reviewed all the procedures in the area and um, the commissioner was happy with the steps that we took to ensure that it wasn't gonna happen again. Um, moving on to the Audit and Accountability Act, this is, um, again, a public right of inspection. Uh, following our publishing of our draft accounts, um, members of the public have 30 days, 30 working days, to request any financial details um, regarding the, the previous financial year that they are interested in receiving, um, with a view to potentially making an objection to our auditors, and no, we'll be speaking to our auditors later on. Um, with the potential need to, to investigate an issue or uh, potentially delay the sign-off of the accounts. Um, our inspection period ran from the, uh, the end of June, 26th of June this year. Um, we received requests for 85 different documents uh, and the inspection period closed without any objections being raised. So that's all been boxed off um, satisfactorily. Uh, the last thing I'll talk about is the Code of Conduct complaint. This is um, an area that perhaps uh, Jill Calder's monitoring officer uh, is more um, au fait with than, than I am. Um, the Members' Code of Conduct uh, for the Combined Authority only relies to our seven members, that's in the, the, uh, the Metro Mayor, and the six leaders and, and the Mayor of the constituent authorities as they are carrying out Combined Authority business. All councillors on, on this committee, on the Overview and Scrutiny Committee, and on the Transport Committee are still uh, subject to their own authority's code of conduct. Um, there were no um, complaints received for any alleged breaches of our code of conduct in 2021 for our seven members. Uh, and then there's just a bit more in the report about the, the update to our code of conduct and a lot of uh, collaborative working between the Combined Authority and our um, the other local authorities uh, who have either adopted the same code to ensure consistency or are uh, based on different versions of the local government associations code, um, just to make sure that everyone's not being surprised by anything that's going on. Um, training is being provided uh, through all the, the councils by an external training provider, um, and this work is, is ongoing um, to ensure that everyone's fully aware of the standards that are expected of them. Thanks, Andy. Are there any questions for Andy? Councillor Maloney. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, that was an excellent report um, and some very interesting information there. I would like to ask if you could give, and I'm not expecting a, an absolutely accurate figure, but some sort of guideline as to what the breakdown, especially in um, FOI and um, audit and accountability, but all if possible, between individuals' requests under the various things, um, media organisations and any public bodies, if, if you could give us an idea of that, please, that would be helpful. Yes, no problem. Um, with, I'll start with the, the audit and accounts one because that's a lot easier. That was just one person who was asking for those for that information. Um, it's, it's quite an, a niche bit of legislation that it doesn't attract a huge amount of interest compared to the Freedom of Information Act. Um, 
in terms of the breakdown for the FOI requests, um, I'd say it's mainly journalists. It's uh, it's it's a uh, probably 50%, I would hazard a guess, is probably journalists who are uh, sending a request to 200 authorities at the same time in the hope of turning something up. Um, isn't necessarily what the legislation was initially designed for, um, but it's it's there and, and they're, they're as able to make a request as anyone else. Um, we have seen a rise of um, community organizations making requests and um, campaign groups, maybe 10 or 15% these days come from those and the rest I would imagine will be individuals. Thank you. Um, are there any more questions? Councillor? James? Okay, thank you for the report. Um, you mentioned that employees of the combined authority have to go through data protection training. Is that the case for every employee of the combined authority and how often are they required to complete the training? It's, uh, it's a question that um, we've looked at a lot, especially over the last um, few years. Our learning team in HR has introduced a new certification uh, scheme for our, we, we have an e-learning, a learning por portal, where there are five data protection um, modules on there, uh, as well as the cybersecurity and freedom of information ones. Um, we looked at people's job roles in the areas that they were working, if there was any involvement with personal information in those areas, um, then we identified them as needing to undertake the mandatory data protection training, uh, which would be refreshed every two years. They would receive a reminder and their manager would be alerted to it. Uh, and that would all be reported corporately, so we would know where the where the uptake was, who needed uh, further work uh, to, uh, to encourage engagement, um, as well as the e-learning um, portal that we have, uh, obviously people learn in different ways, I, I often go out to different teams and provide you know, bespoke sessions to them on their areas as well, kind of as, as the need arises. So it's, um, it's something that is identified a lot in uh, officers, um, the individual uh, performance plans, our IPPs that we have. Um, so it's something that we're, we keep quite a, a tight leash on. Any more questions? No. Um, can I? Can we agree the recommendations set out on page seven? Thank you. Item five, internal audit update. Can I invite Laura Williams, head of internal audit, to present the internal audit, please? And can I just ask officers when they're doing, please, the acronyms? Well, I'm not very quick catching on to what they are, but there are people that may not understand what they are. So could I, as a request, just ask, could you bear that in mind? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Laura. Thank you, Thank you Chair. Um, okay, so this report gives you um, a, a, an update on the internal audit work of uh, quarter two to date. Um, and gives you a breakdown of the four uh, audits that we've completed in that period. Uh, and those are listed for you uh, in section two of the report. Um, pleasing to note that there weren't any uh, major organisational risk opinions arising from the, the works. So obviously, those would be the ones that I will be drawing your attention to. Um, so none of those have arisen in the period. We have uh, two, however, of moderate organisational risk, which is the next uh, category down. Um, and those again are, are listed for you. Um, during the, uh, as a result of the work, um, we have uh, made a couple of high priority recommendations, actually the, the same recommendation to Mersey Travel and to the CA. So the way that it's presented in the report shows it as two recommendations, but it is essentially uh, the same piece of work. And that is uh, focused on uh, reminders to. Um, staff right across the organisation about some of the key principles of uh, governance and I, I spoke at length about that at the uh, last uh, meeting but that is set out for you um, at section 4.3 as one of the recommendations um, of note and work is ongoing with all of the um, executive uh, leadership team to, to progress that piece of work. Uh, the report also gives you a breakdown of 
recommendations that have been made in the past and where um, implementation uh, and how implementation on those is progressing. Um, and we do draw out for you a, a number of areas where there is a, a significant number of recommendations um, and gives you some um, detail around how those um, are progressing. Uh, and those are at section uh, 336 on page 25 of your packs. Um, we also then give a breakdown of our performance as an internal audit section um, and we are obliged to do this under the public sector internal audit standard so section six gives you a breakdown of, of where we are against our key performance indicators um, obviously one that will uh, jump out uh, to you on page 31 is our percentage of the plan completed so at this stage in the year um, even though we are a little bit ahead of the end of quarter two we will be looking at a target of 30 percent of our work completed um, at this stage, we are only at 11%, unfortunately, which doesn't give me any pleasure. But what I would say is that, um, and the report sets this out, um, is that we did have a knock-on effect from some sickness absence earlier in the year, and that has set us back a little. But we do have a good deal of work um, in progress, um, and taking that into account um, puts us at around 32% completed. So, um, so that is more encouraging, and I do hope to be in a position to report much more positively to you at the next meeting um, but uh, I would also assure you that we will deliver the plan by year end um, as well. Um, then moving through to section seven of the report that gives you a breakdown on where we are with our um, self-assessment against the code of practice on managing the risk of fraud and corruption. Um, we identified a number of actions uh, many of which are in progress a couple of which are completed we continue to uh, to progress those um, and similar to um, a previous colleague was talking about in terms of take up of, of training um, we also have some fraud awareness e-learning uh, training on the table um, and round about half the workforce has completed that and that is the subject of continued efforts to push and promote uh, that so that we can increase take up in that area um, the section also gives you some details around the proactive counter fraud work that we do to prevent and detect fraud against the, uh, uh, across the organisation um, and also the National Fraud Initiative which again has been positive in terms of, of turning up uh, very little in terms of, um, of actual fraud and error um, so a small amount um, of £3,840 um, on a, a duplicate creditor record which is, is really really good and it does give us um, positive assurance uh, that our systems and processes for uh, detecting uh, fraud in those key areas are effective. And then finally some, some good news, uh, members may remember at the last meeting I spoke to you about our forthcoming uh, public sector internal audit standards external assessment uh, which took place uh, last month and I'm pleased to say that the initial findings of the report are that we fully comply with, with those standards um, which is really excellent and um, members of the committee obviously participated in the review, uh, members past and present uh, participated in the review along with a number of officers so thank you again uh, for your support um, with that piece of work. Um, and then the appendices just give you, appendix A gives you a breakdown of the full plan and, and a status report on each of the items within the plan um, and Appendix B just gives some reference material for you in terms of the risk opinions um, and the priority levels of the recommendations. So I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you, Laura. Can I also say, would you thank the staff that was involved in getting this all correct and thing? it must have been hard work. So if you would pass on our congratulations to them. Thank you. Are there any questions for Laura? No. Um, can we agree the recommendations on page 15 of the report, please? Agreed. Right. Risk management. Can I invite Laura to take us through the, the risk management, please? Thank you, Chair. Uh, so this but um, carries on from the, the previous report that I uh, submitted to you at the, the last meeting, um, which gives an update on where we are in terms of progressing uh, with implementing risk management across the organisation. Um, hopefully you picked up from the report that we've made a great deal of progress as an organisation with this um, over the last 12 to 18 months. Um, 
with um, the appointment of a risk manager. Obviously, um, we've also had uh, some fairly significant uh, events risk-wise in, in that time as well. Um, but it's been very, very pleasing to see how we've uh, successfully uh, implemented this uh, system and, and really started to get it working for the organisation in that time. So um, hopefully a positive report in terms of reflecting on that progress. A um, couple of things I'd like to draw to your attention. First of all, the corporate risk register work um, that we've completed. And again, I alluded to this at the previous meeting. Um, we've done a complete refresh of the corporate risk register. Members will be aware that we have recently, as an organisation, approved uh, a new corporate plan. And we wanted to align the corporate risk register with that corporate plan to make sure that all of the right risks um, to the um, threats to the achievements of that plan are fully reflected within the risk register. So we, we've gone through um, a significant pro process with our executive leadership team um, and individual executive directors to, to progress that. Um, and attached to the report is um, a full uh, refreshed corporate risk register, but also a slide pack, which is hopefully a little bit more user friendly um, in terms of identifying the, um, the five uh, overarching risks that have been generated from that process. Um, we've also included for you at section 2.4 of the report um, a wash up really of, of the corporate risk register from last year, as you would imagine, many of those risks are still pertinent to the combined authority and therefore have been rolled forward into the new risk register in one shape or another. Uh, but some of these risks have uh, pleasingly reduced to a level where they can be managed at service level and no longer uh, require reflection at the corporate level, which is really positive to see. So, um, so that table, um, section 2.4, gives you a flavour for um, the, the actions that have been taken to make sure that everything has been picked up or dealt, or dealt, or dealt with um, in one way or another. So section 2.6 just gives you a, a pictorial representation of the five risks that we have uh, generated. And, and I think um, hopefully you will agree that this uh, represents a much clearer way forward for the risk register. Those of you who saw us it in its old state will remember sort of 13 or 14 risks. Um, it was very granular in, in detail. This is no less granular, but does give us a, a clear way forward in terms of a, a, a very clear thematic approach that I think means that met, well, all of the, the key corporate risks can be embraced within one of these areas. Um, and as we go forward, hopefully makes it much clearer to understand as some of these risks change and develop over time as well. Um, so, as I say, um, there is uh, a summary included at Appendix A, but I've also included the full risk register for you at Appendix B, which gives all of the details um, and members may wish to take a view on, on which of those documents they would wish to see going forward. If they'd like to continue to see both, we can facilitate uh, that or whether they would prefer just to have um, a high level summary that obviously can be facilitated as well. Happy to do whatever the committee prefers on that. Um, and then section three um, outlines some of the other activities that have been ongoing uh, to embed effective risk management across the organisation. So just picking out a couple of those, we've talked about the corporate risk register review se session. Um, we continue to work with our senior leadership team. So these are heads of service, if you will, uh, to look at updating uh, their service risks with the continued effects of the pandemic, because obviously it continues to have an impact. Um, but obviously that impact is slightly different now than it was, you know, 12 or even six months ago. Um, but also the other emerging risks that are coming onto the um, horizon. Uh, we also organise and, and I chair a quarterly uh, officer risk group meeting, uh, which is really developing into a very positive forum for this discussion of risk um, and is really helping to shape how we view uh, risk across the organisation and is really getting the message out there. Um, so again, that's been uh, very positive. Uh, and members will also remember uh, at the last meeting, uh, you approved the risk management policy and we have been rolling um, out the, the new policy and the revised risk register template across the organisation um, as a result of that. And finally, um, table uh, there at section 3.3, which just highlights for you the progress we're making on implementing our internal audit recommendations um, around risk management. So we are the subject of internal audit. Um, I have to take my audit hat off, put my risk management hat on then. Um, and we have completed most of the actions. There is just one um, that is outstanding uh, to complete by the end of this calendar year. 
Uh, so I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you, Laura. Councillor Morgan. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Laura, you, you mentioned earlier on about the corporate plan. Uh, so how can we ensure risk management and the performance management are integrated to ensure that we reach the corporate plan priorities? Yeah, we put a lot of work into, and we continue to put a lot of work into alignment of the two documents. So we're very keen to make sure that the corporate plan um, and the corporate risk register are aligned. Um, so we, we have undertaken that work. You can see um, that there are linkages um, across the two documents. Um, but obviously, you'll, you'll also be aware of the fact that there is a network of of services that sit beneath that that are actually doing the work to, to actually deliver on the corporate plan. So what we're working on now is ensuring that within those service risk registers, there is also that alignment uh, to make sure that those significant threats to the achievement of the plan are reflected and that we have actions um, aligned to those to make sure that we can, as best as possible, deliver on our corporate plan priorities. Thank you, Laura. Are there anyone else would like to ask Laura a question? Yeah, hello, Laura. Do, do you have any time scale to uh, get the five red scores down to green or amber? You, you um, it all lies in the, in the actions um, that are uh, aligned to each of, of those. Um, so within the full risk register, um, if I can just find the page, um, or even in the in the slide pack at, at Appendix A, you'll see that each of the risks is set out for you. So if we take risk for the transport model, for example, um, we we have um, on the second page, we've got a, a number of actions um, outlined there. And for example, we've got a, a date there of December 2021, uh, where we are hoping as an organisation, we will um, have completed those actions. And on completion of those actions, you would expect there to be a reduction in, in the residual score. Now, it could be that they are still red at that point because residually on transport, for example, we are at 20. Um, if we were to reduce to 16, that would still be classed as red. But what we want to see then is, is additional actions to say, well, we've reduced it to 20. Uh, how can we reduce it further? And indeed, how can we reduce it to what we call our target risk, which is where we as low as we think we can get the, the score associated with that risk so what we've been very keen to do um, as, as part of this process is to make sure that we've got actions aligned to each of the risks and we will hold um, officers to account and indeed this committee will hold officers to account in terms of, of completion of those actions within time scale um, so i think the the risk register sets up the plan to address those and obviously links back to the corporate plan as we've discussed um, but we do need to make sure that we, we stay on track with those and indeed that those actions change as they need to over time. Maybe that some of these actions become obsolete or are no longer as relevant. We might identify that there are other things that we can do or better things that we can do um, to reduce these scores. But um, but as I say, within that time, those time scales associated with each of the actions, that should give you a flavour in terms of, of when we are hoping um, to have completed those things to, to bring those uh, scores uh, down, but they may still be red. Um, so the target score is also a place that gives a clue in terms of that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Anyone else would like to ask a question? Councillor? Hi, Laura. Thank you for your report. It's interesting, actually. Well, I think you did ask about how we'd like to receive the information. And I have to say, I actually liked um, the way you did it with the, the themes. And obviously, you've got the chart, which we're all used to looking at this Excel spreadsheet with lots of columns. But I actually found it much easier looking at the theme. So I thank you for that. And I'd obviously like to see that uh, continue, really, for us, because it's so much easier to read and take on board. Thank you. Yes, I, I agree. Thank, thank you. Yes, I'm really happy to, to continue to do that. And indeed, that's how we're reporting um, and discussing this with um, the executive leadership team as well. I think the feedback's been overwhelming that, that this is what everybody prefers, really. It's, it's much, much easier to digest, but be assured that all of the detail sits behind that as well. So if we need to, to dig into the detail, I'll also have that available for you. OK, thank you. Anyone else like to ask a question? No? Um, can we agree the recommendations set out on page 43 of the report, please? Agreed. Thank you. 
Item 7, Annual state Statement of Accounts 2021. Can I invite Sarah Johnson, Assistant Director for Finance, to present the Annual Statement of Accounts 2021, please? Thank you, Chair. This report um, would ordinarily be bringing you a final set of accounts and an audit completion report, which is our external auditors, Mazar's findings on their work conducted as part of the audit. Unfortunately, the audit, while substantially complete, does have some elements that are outstanding, and therefore what is presented to members here is a copy of the draft audit completion report, and unfortunately it's the draft set of accounts. In itself, that's not necessarily a problem, um, as Mark, who is on the call from Mazars, will, will detail. We don't envisage there being any significant changes to the accounts. However, clearly, until the accounts are finalised, we have held off on sending that through. So, as I mentioned, the, the accounts have been subject to audit. We have an audit completion report, which is broadly very positive, um, and it does look, without wishing to steal Mark's thunder, as if we will be given a unqualified opinion on our, our accounts. Now, unlike in previous years, they have decoupled the value for money judgment from the opinion on the statement of accounts. Um, that's unusual, and it will be later in the year that we will report back on that. If I can hand over to Mark, Mark will take you through some of the specific elements of interest to members in the audit completion report. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Chair. Uh, we will take uh, the report uh, as read, but I would propose to spend just a few moments highlighting the, the key elements before inviting questions from members of the committee. So in terms of the absolute headlines, these are detailed on page five of our report, which is page 83 of your pack. And uh, as Sarah has said, uh, the Audit and Governance Committee will be pleased to know that uh, subject to the satisfactory completion of the now limited outstanding work, we do anticipate issuing a clean, unqualified opinion on your financial statements. Uh, the accounts that were presented uh, for audit were of a good quality and uh, per page 93, very few and only minor audit adjustments have arisen through the audit process. Per page 93, no control deficiencies have been identified to date. Per page 95, no significant difficulties were encountered during the audit and per section 4, which is pages 91 to 94 of your pack, and subject to the satisfactory completion of the outstanding work, there are no matters to report to the committee against the significant risks that we highlighted at the start of the audit. It is fair to say that some issues and some misstatements may arise as we complete the outstanding work, uh, and we will provide the Audit and Governance Committee with an updated audit completion follow-up report prior to signing off. But I think it is appropriate just to say that uh, at this stage, it is a really, really positive outcome from the audit. And on that basis, I would like to just take a, a moment to formally thank uh, the finance team for both the quality of the accounts and also for uh, the assistance that they have provided throughout the audit. Just a, a quick but really important uh, note on the status of uh, the audit. Uh, the committee will note at the top of page 85 of your papers uh, in relation to our pensions work, we are still awaiting assurances from the Merseyside Pension Fund Auditor and until we receive those assurances, we won't be in a position to sign the audit opinion. We are expecting those assurances later this week, uh, but it is fair to say that there may well be some follow-up procedures that we need to undertake, and in undertaking those procedures, that might delay us signing off beyond the 30th of September target date. Uh, the committee may also note on page 85 of uh, your pack that a number of other audit procedures do remain in progress. It's fair to say that we're making good progress on these, we continue to work with the finance team um, and uh, it is fair to say that we do expect at this stage that the only issue um, that's likely to be outstanding as at the 30th of September is our work on the pension uh, liability. 
Uh, Sarah said in relation to our value for money work that uh, reporting has been delayed to uh, the end of the year. It is fair to say that given the delay to our value for money work and the reporting thereof, and also the delay in the guidance from the National Audit Office in relation to our whole of government accounts work, we won't be able to certify within the next couple of weeks completion of uh, the audit. This is nothing uh, particular to the combined authority, it is very much the position across the local government sector. Uh, we do confirm in Appendix C, as you would expect, that's page 112 of your pack, that the audit team has been appropriately independent and objective throughout the audit. And finally, we include um, at uh, Appendix A, that's page 103 of your pack, a letter of representation that we are seeking from management. Uh, this is our standard letter of representation. We're not seeking any specific representations over and above the normal representations that the committee would expect and will have seen in previous uh, years. I'll stop there, Chair, and happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Maloney. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, apologies, Chair. I must declare an interest, um, which I overlooked. Um, as a member of the Merseyside Pension Fund Local Pension Board, um, it's, I, I, I feel I should actually declare that. Thanks, Chair. Is there anyone else like to ask a question? No? Sarah, Sarah, my hand and back to you, or have you finished? I've finished, Chair. Thank you. Oh, right. Oh, well, thank you. Um, so, can I? Can we agree the recommendation set out on page 75 of the report, please? Agreed, Chair. Agreed. Thank you. Item 8. Any other business? There is no items of urgent business submitted to the meeting. Um, I can now clear the meeting close and thank you all for attending and thank you for being patient.